1966, a federal judge captured in a few words a legal re revolution that promised to free Americans from the crushing weight of discrimination, and it took tremendous courage. Many judges, especially those from the South, faced ostracism, intimidation, and threats of violence for expanding civil rights. But this judge, nevertheless, wrote these words. The Constitution is both colorblind and color conscious. To avoid conflict with the Equal Protection Clause, a classification that benefits, uh, that denies a benefit, causes harm, or imposes a burden, must not be based on race. In that sense, the Constitution is colorblind. But the Constitution is color conscious to prevent discrimination being perpetuated and to undo the effects of past discrimination. The case was U.S. versus Jefferson County Board of Education from the Fifth Circuit. Its author, John Minor Wisdom, served 42 years on the Fifth Circuit. The awards we confer today honor those who have made outstanding contributions in Judge Wisdom's spirit to the work of the American Law Institute. That same year, 1966, a United States Senator denounced the evil of social classifications in a country that stubbornly embraced and defended apartheid. At Cape Town, the Senator said this, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. And he continued, for two centuries, my own country has struggled to overcome the self-imposed handicap of prejudice and discrimination based on nationality, on social class or race, discrimination profoundly repugnant to the theory and to the command of our Constitution. And that senator was Robert F. Kennedy. Kennedy's invitation to speak in South Africa came from a student anti-apartheid group. More specifically, the group's young vice president, Margaret Marshall, asked Kennedy to present the Day of Affirmation address in South Africa. And she did so at personal risk. When the country learned that the students had invited Kennedy to speak, it banned its president from attending public or political events. Yet that did not deter Margaret Marshall from greeting RFK at the airport and accompanying him as he toured the country. Kennedy's ripple of hope speech inspired Margie to pursue a career in law and to later deploy her skills to change society. In 1968, she would flee South Africa's persecution against those fighting apartheid. And to our great fortune, she wound up on our shores. You can see that then and now, the world was engaged in a serious dialogue about the rule of law and its extension to disfavored groups. Judge Wisdom had the courage to expand access to law in the face of intransigence. RFK knew very well, very personally, the danger that follows outspoken confrontation of the status quo. And Margie, at a very young age, vowed to confront the apartheid infrastructure at enormous, enormous personal jeopardy. You might even say she exemplifies the unexampled courage that Judge Gergel explored in his discussion with Judge Michelle Childs here just yesterday. Margie showed most famously in her 2003 decision, and this was before Obergefell, holding that the Massachusetts Constitution confers same-sex couples the right to marry, that state courts have also blazed trails of freedom in this country. She 
like wisdom, cast ripples that have swept down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Margaret is a wonderful recipient of this award for another reason. She is a good and compassionate person. She was not only a leader among chiefs of the state courts, but a warm friend and mentor to them all, including me. Genuine kindness was also true of Judge Wisdom. One of his former clerks, Judge Brock Hornsby, wrote me just a few days ago. He recounted how Judge Wisdom would send to the children of his longtime waiter a book each Christmas. Professor Emre Sazeli at Loyola New, York, New Orleans College of Law said that wisdom in sending those books taught him not only to love the written word, but by later reading about William, uh, wisdom's courageous rulings inspired his legal and academic career. We should never forget that such small acts of kindness resound to the good, perhaps over generations and lifetimes. For her courage in the face of a brutal regime, for her clear judicial decrees expanding the rule of law and access to it to everyone, for her own graceful humanity, the American Law Institute presents to Margaret Marshall the John Minor Wisdom Award. To receive the John Minor Wisdom Award from Wallace Jefferson on behalf of the American Law Institute is a moment of high honor for me. I didn't have the honor of serving with a judge on the Council of the American Law Institute. He was off just a few years before I, I came on. But I did meet the judge because my husband, Anthony Lewis, was a huge admirer of his, and I think it was returned. But there's a reason that I feel so honored about this award, because the judge influenced me in a very direct way. I came as a naive, young, white South African girl to an American high school in 1962. I arrived in September. On October 2nd, barely a month later, the New York Times ran a banner headline right across the top, all columns, about the 30,000 federal troops that had been sent to Mississippi because a judge had ordered a black man admitted to the University of Mississippi. By the way, if you take a look at that front page, there's a piece by Anthony Lewis on it. It had never occurred to me that the law could be a force of good, because I lived in a country where law was used day in and day out to oppress, suppress, and distress people. And I began to think differently about the law. And to my parents' somewhat amazement, when I returned home, I was a very different child. What Judge Wisdom did in that great opinion that Wallace has just, uh, from which Wallace has just quoted, made a difference because Wallace was the benefit of color blindness. Wallace Jefferson is not the first black chief justice of a state court in the United States, but he is one of the very few and when Wallace assumed that position, we all, the Chief Justices and the whole of Texas and others, came to know a brilliant, dedicated, human, generous man who was beloved not only by states across the country, but as all of you have seen during his tenure here at the ALI as one of our officers, one of the great justices of our nation. 
but he also mentioned color conscious. And it distresses me to know that there are 24 state Supreme Courts that have no black person on them, that there are 40 state Supreme Courts that have no Latinos on them, and there are 42 state Supreme Courts that have no people of Asian descent on them. We are delighted that color blindness may have been achieved. Color consciousness has not been achieved. I am proud to say the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court has two black justices, one of whom is the Chief Justice, the first black woman to serve in that position in my lifetime, I mean in the, in the country's lifetime. And last, the ALI. Last night, Roberta Ramo at the council's dinner said something that struck me deeply. The ALI is important to democracy. The ALI is critical to democracy because the rule of law is the fundamental underpinning of democracy. And what I loved about this morning was this amazing group of people going line by line, making sure that we got the rule of law just right. And we did it carefully and collegially and deliberately. What you are doing in this organization and for the next 100 years will make the difference to whether we are or we are not a democracy. And this is not the time to stop working on the rule of law. Thank you for this great honor. I want to tell you about the amazing Mary Schroeder and why she is so deserving of this award. Mary has served on our council, worked on government ethics, consumer contracts, agency, children in the law, foreign relations law, and sentencing. Chaired our awards committee, <clears throat> served on our audit committee and program committee, opened our 2007 annual meeting, and joined Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Brock Hornby at our special session honoring Sandra Day O'Connor. <clears throat> Mary graduated from Swarthmore College, where she later received an honorary Doctor of Laws degree, and the University of Chicago Law School, where she met Milt Schroeder, her wonderful husband, scholar, and our colleague. They have two daughters, Caroline and Catherine. Mary began her remarkable career as a civil trial attorney in the U.S. Department of Justice. She and Milt then moved to Arizona, where she clerked with Justice Jesse Udall of the Arizona Supreme Court. She practiced at Lewis and Rocha with our dear friend, John Frank, the first woman to be an associate and then a partner. She then became the youngest woman appellate judge in the nation on the Arizona Court of Appeal. In 1979, President Carter nominated and the Senate confirmed Mary to the Ninth Circuit. In 2000, she made history again by becoming the first woman to serve as Chief Judge. Chief Judge Schroeder confronted various challenges, including bills to split the circuit by legislators dissatisfied an environmental decision or the Pledge of Allegiance. She testified in opposition and she enlisted widespread support to defeat judicial gerrymandering and preserve judicial independence. I consulted with our newest great legal resource, Chat GDP, <laughs> and asked it to summarize that situation in a few lines of rap. 
<laughs> so here it goes, yo. <laughs> Chief, Chief Judge Mary Schroeder, bold and wise, preserves the Ninth Circuit's unity prize. With courage and grit, she stands tall. Against misguided splits, she won't fall. Her, her gavel strikes justice, answering the call. Mary served as president of the National Association of Women Judges and as a trustee of the American Inns of Court. She received the Arizona State Bar Association's James A. Walsh Outstanding Jurist Award, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State established a prize in her honor for a law student committed to public service, and the ABA's Margaret Brent Award recognized her innovative approach to balancing work and family. <clears throat> when interviewed, as an ABA woman trailblazer in the law by Trish Rifo, later ABA president, Mary said, the great case of my career was Hirabayashi, a remarkable man. He was a student at the University of Washington when the curfew and then the internment were imposed in 1942. He refused to obey and decided that he would rather be prosecuted. He was prosecuted and the case went to the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the curfew and the subsequent internment on the basis of supposed imminent danger to the country by the Japanese Americans. This all turned out to have been based on a report that the Army falsified. With Mary's powerful opinion, the Ninth Circuit ordered that both convictions be vacated. In a separate case, Fred Korematsu's conviction was vacated, and the government later acknowledged that it had misled the court in both cases. In rejecting the government's contention that Hirabayashi's case was moot, Mary said, a United States citizen who is convicted of a crime on account of race is lastingly aggrieved. Lee Rosenthal, in her moving tribute when Mary became an emeritus council member, mentioned that Mrs. Hirabashi, after her husband's death, wrote to Mary and said he quoted that memorable sentence every time he spoke to groups. Lee also mentioned many compliments about Mary from colleagues, former law clerks, and court administrative personnel. She is cherished by everyone she encounters. She has an amazing ability to fight hard and yet have her opponents stay or become her friends. She made us feel like we all mattered to the circuit. Mary appreciates the responsibilities of membership, of mentorship, and the joys of seeing her mentees contribute to our world. Arizona Federal Defender John Sands recalls her encouraging prosecutors and defendants, defenders and diverse others to become ALI members and contributing her expertise in criminal law and sentencing. Former Arizona Governor, Secretary of Homeland Security, and President of the University of California said in a note to me, Janet, Janet, Napolo, Janet Napolitano says, I'm so glad Mary is receiving the Wisdom Award. It's much deserved. To me, Mary epitomizes the role of mentor. Without her, I never would have moved to Phoenix or met John Frank and joined Lewis and Rocha or left to become U.S. attorney or run for elective office in my own right. In short, her mentorship and friendship have been deep, meaningful, and impactful. She really cares for her clerks and goes out of her way to stay in touch with them throughout their careers. She's an amazing person. I gathered there are some law clerks former law clerks here for Barry's as part of the hopefully cheering section for her today. And they, <laughs> great. Like the legendary John Minor Wisdom, Mary Schroeder has helped right the wrongs of history and mentored others to do so. Mary, it is an honor and pleasure to present to you this handsome silver plate that says for outstanding contributions 
to the work of the American Law Institute in the spirit of Judge Wisdom, a council member who wished to be remembered as one who attempted to judge according to his conscience and the law and was influ influential in bringing about an improvement in the social life of this country. Presented to Mary Schroeder, May 22, 2023. And now I'll lift it briefly. It's a... Mary? Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the Institute for this great honor. It, and it is such an honor and a pleasure to share it with my good friend, Margie Marshall, whom I've admired for so long. And I, I thank the, the Institute for being gracious enough to let me say just a few words. And I'd like to say something about three subjects. First, my trainer. Second, about Judge Wisdom and then about the Institute itself. I hold Mike Trainer up to my law clerks as the role model for young lawyers who want to provide zealous representation for their clients, improve our system of justice, and in their spare time, lead the fight to preserve the environment for future generations. Mike has done it all, so I tell young lawyers in my office to be like Mike. This award is named for one of my heroes, John Wisdom, so it's particularly meaningful to me. I had the good fortune to know Judge Wisdom and to sit with him when he visited our circuit. His courageous role in deciding the cases that helped desegregate the South in the wake of Brown versus Board, along with uh, the few other brave judges in the old Fifth Circuit, was recounted some years ago in a wonderful book by Jack Bass called Unlikely Heroes. In a fit, a fit of hero worship myself, I asked John to sign my copy for me. And his inscription reads, to Mary Schroeder with warm regards from one who never regarded himself as any kind of a hero, John Minor Wisdom. The book so endorsed is one of my most treasured possessions. Many years ago, I was at a meeting of appellate judges in New Orleans, and we decided to ask Judge Wisdom to join us at the Commander's Palace restaurant. And as we waited for him to arrive, it was a very busy restaurant, suddenly everything was quiet. Every wait person, the entire staff of that restaurant stood almost at attention. The kitchen door opened and the kitchen staff came out. We said, what is happening? And the, the word went around the restaurant, the judge is coming. <laughs> and in New Orleans, there was only one judge, and that was Judge Wisdom. Finally, about the ALI. I have learned over the years, along with Mike Trainer, that very little of importance can be achieved in the law or in the administration of justice without the cooperation of all of the constituent parts of our profession, the practitioners, the public servants, the professors, and the judges. The ALI may not generally be thought of as an inclusive organization, but in an important sense, that is exactly what it is. Its mission is to involve all the parts of the legal profession in projects intended to improve the law. Thus, to me, the ALI is our country's preeminent independent organization seeking to move the law forward in a spirit of cooperation and inclusion. And so in a time when our system is under severe stress, that effort is more important than ever. And I thank you for this award, which is very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you.